Jordan said, my name is Jay Kaufman. Thanks guys for uh, tuning in. I know it's uh, it's the holidays. It's crazy enough uh, as it is, especially in the evening time. So I appreciate you guys coming out. And uh, hopefully uh, we spark some good conversation. It gets really boring on Zooms if I'm just up here uh, pontificating to you guys. So please uh, toss in any questions in the chat um, and Jordan will kind of sort through those and we'll make sure everybody gets everything answered and, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I've been around the fire service my entire life. My dad was a, uh, was a fireman just outside of Washington, DC. Um, and actually on the way home from the hospital, my parents brought me to my dad's firehouse to pick something up before I ever went home. So uh, my mom likes to blame my dad for, uh, for the bug. But um, I've worked now in the uh, city of Toledo uh, as a fireman for eight years. Um, I tell people all the time that uh, I'm the luckiest guy that I know. Uh, started as a volunteer, worked part-time, worked paid and got in with the city of Toledo pretty young. Um, and then I've been lucky enough and blessed enough to have three good rotations uh, out of our academy. So when you're done with drill school in Toledo, you do three four month rotations. Uh, they try to keep you on the same shift, but sometimes they'll bump you from shift to shift and from battalion to battalion to kind of get you some more experience and uh, different personalities and different crews. And uh, I was very lucky to have three awesome crews full of senior guys to learn from. And uh, I was kind of in the right place at the right time and uh, I'll, I'll ended up getting a bid to uh, Rescue 7 uh, downtown uh, in, our, in the Old West End on the fringes of downtown. Uh, one of our two heavy rescue companies uh, ended up getting that pretty young. So I've been blessed that uh, I've had a lot of good experiences and had a lot of chances to make a lot of mistakes, which in a lot of ways is what I use to, uh, to teach from. So um, one of the things that I teach a lot of is RIT. And I can tell you that uh, if you'd asked me seven years ago, uh, if I would ever teach uh, RIT or be a big RIT guy, I would have told you absolutely not. Uh, it's just not my thing. And uh, on January 26, 2020, that all changed uh, for our entire department when we lost uh, Jamie Dickman and Steve Machinsky at uh, 528 Magnolia Street. And um, after, after looking at that incident and the structure type and the similarities between that fire and a lot of the, the other fires, line of duty death case studies that were out there and a lot of the, um, the studies that were done afterwards, uh, such as in Phoenix with Brett Tarver, or actual analysis of line of duty deaths, we found that there was a lot more similarities than differences when it came to uh, RIT and uh, firefighter survival, both techniques, timing, strategy. And so we pretty much kind of turned it around and said, what, what can we do to kind of revolutionize or, or shift the paradigm a little bit from the traditional RIT model of four guys standing outside in the yard around a Stokes basket full of crap. Um, how can we be a little bit more effective and uh, how can we really enhance what's already going on uh, on the inside? So um, I'm sure everybody's heard that uh, if a mayday is called uh, on the fire ground, I'm pretty sure every textbook is going to mention that you should stay committed to your primary assignment and let RIT come in and save the day. Most departments have SOPs that probably say that, but the reality is that's not happening. I'm not here to say that's one that's good or bad, but uh, if you look at um, groups such as Project Mayday, looking at how often the, uh, the Mayday firefighter is reached first by RIT, it's a very minuscule amount. So really what can we do to empower our people that are already inside to use their experience and best judgment to determine if they can uh, make a difference in saving this guy's life? Or um, what else can RIT bring to the table that those interior crews can't? And typically for us, that's one of two things. They can either bring water or they can bring air. Those are the two things that are really going to buy us time when it comes to uh, firefighter rescue operations. So um, in looking at our, in our line of duty deaths and uh, trying to learn as much as we could, I uh, kind of ended up down the rabbit hole and um, kind of ended up here, I guess. Sorry, Where do you want to go from there? Sorry, uh, go ahead. No, no, no. I just posted the uh, link to Project Mayday so people can uh, look at that and reference it. There's some wonderful information. I think you just updated not too long ago. Um, he yeah. uh, looked like there's some new, some new stats and things in there. So that yeah, is definitely I, some stuff to pull from. Yeah, Chief Abbott is, uh, is doing a fantastic job when it comes to um, 
when it comes to updating that and really getting a lot of that good information uh, out there when it comes to RIT. So if you want, I can uh, actually click over, Jordan, and uh, share my screen. Yeah, so absolutely. Click through some of these. Okay. All right. Like I said, uh, if anybody's got any questions at any time, please uh, toss them in the chat and uh, we'll make sure that I get to them or you'll have my contact info by the end of it. And uh, we'll make, uh, make sure you get your questions answered and do whatever I can to uh, get you anything that I can. You see the slide there? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, so again, a lot of these things I'm sure you, you guys have heard uh, yourselves, whether it's um, we don't have enough people on scene to do RIT or uh, we got a pretty good system. If it's not broke, let's not fix it. We don't go to those fires. That was something that we uh, were guilty of saying. Uh, when you look at Phoenix, where Brett Tarver died in the Southwest supermarket, or you look at Asheville, North Carolina, where Captain Jeff Bowen died in an, uh, an office building fire in the middle of the day, I said, hey, this is Toledo. Uh, we have a lot, we have thousands and thousands of vacant homes, and we're burning a couple of those every single day. Those are the fires that we go to. Those are the fires we need to be prepared for. Our procedure is rock solid, right? Like we train on RIT, we're good, we know what to do, we know where the equipment is. But uh, in our experience, experience is something you don't get until right after you needed it. Like I said, uh, January 26, 2014, we lost Jamie and Steve at 528 Magnolia Street in a uh, two-story type three ordinary construction uh, apartment building. Uh, you had apartments above a garage uh, with an with a lean-to addition off the back of an undetermined age. Uh, the overall size of the first floor, I believe, was 18 feet by 44. And the second floor, I want to say, was 18 feet or 18 feet by something about 30 feet, give or take. So not a very large area. Um, again, ordinary construction. Uh, no windows along the Bravo side. Uh, limited access. Uh, only The only access to the second floor was from some stairs uh, in on the Delta side, in the kind of the Charlie Delta corner, which was only accessible from the alley. Um, if you if you haven't seen it or heard it or been to a class put on by Battalion Chief Benedum from Toledo Fire, I would highly suggest you go to that. Um, Chief Benedum was in charge of our investigative uh, panel and does a fantastic job that really breaks down the entire uh, the entire incident at 528 Magnolia. So I'm not trying to trying to take anything away from that. Captain Benedum is definitely the guy, or excuse me, Battalion Chief Benedum is definitely the guy to talk to when it comes to any of the specifics. I really use that as the catalyst for what happened that day and how have we adapted since. So I look at it kind of from a writ perspective rather than a global uh, operational and strategic perspective. So I like to break things down into, into five things, whether it's for technical rescue, we talk about uh, take five, and we have a take five for every every technical rescue discipline, or five things for RIT, or big five tools that we'll talk about here in a second. It makes stuff so much easier for guys to remember, because you can write a 10-page uh, policy, or you can write a three-page policy, and we'll be honest, probably 60% of the guys aren't even going to read it if it's one page. So we need something that's easy to remember, not only three weeks from now, but at three o'clock in the morning, when uh, things aren't going so well. So when we really break it down to the fast five RIT essentials, we talk about mindset, uh, what tools we're gonna need, all this stuff we're gonna talk about here real quick. So we need to change that RIT mindset. For the longest time, like I said, procedures and textbooks, everything said interior crews are gonna continue doing their job and RIT is gonna come in and fix whatever the problem is. In a vacuum, that sounds really good because, of course, the interior crews are the interior for a reason. They have an important job. And if they were to just stop what they're doing, there's a very good chance that conditions could get worse or more additional maydays could occur. So traditionally, RIT was the Navy SEALs. They're, the, they're high trained. They're going to be there to save the day. Really, what we need to do as the fire service is change that mentality rather than here to save the day, we're the cavalry. We need to be thought of as the cavalry. We're not here to, to kick anybody out. We're not here to, to save anybody's ass. We're here to just help out the crews that are already inside. So how can we empower crews that are inside to start firefighter rescue operations? And then how can we prepare our RIT crew to supplement what's already going on inside? 
not to take over, but just to supplement and assist. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who gets this guy out. We just need to get this down firefighter out of the building and to EMS. Uh, reference Project Mayday, like I said, uh, Chief Abbott has some fantastic information. Jordan put the link in the, uh, in the chat. 36% of the time that firefighter self-rescues. Maybe they fell into a basement. Maybe they got lost. Maybe they got a little tangled up. They clear the, uh, the mayday somehow by themselves. About a quarter of the time, that firefighter's crew either rescues or makes first contact with that down firefighter. Another quarter of the time, another interior crew. So maybe uh, something happens to a firefighter on search and somebody from backup makes first contact with them. What that leaves is about 15% of the time, mayday happens when RIT is on scene and established. So you look 36, 26, 25, what well, we're over about 85, 85, 86%. I'm not a calculator, but um, the issue is RIT isn't making first contact with the down firefighter very often. And then even when the May Day does happen, you got what, maybe a, a one, in, one in 10, one in eight chance of it happening when RIT is even there. So if that's the case, maybe we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket and say that RIT is the end all be all. Kind of like I've been saying this entire time, we have to empower those interior crews to use their judgment and experience to make decisions. Even on our department, we're very young. We've hired a couple hundred people over the last 10 years. And there are some times where you're gonna have a crew that is gonna be able to split up and, and do different things. And the officer is gonna have faith in their crew. And there's gonna be other crews where they're younger, they have less experience, and that officer is not gonna be able to decide to split their crew. But really, we focus on being fast and flexible. How can we get RIT in place and ready to respond as quickly as possible through whatever door, window, wall, roof, whatever access is going to be the fastest? And again, we want RIT to be the cavalry. We're here to help. We're not here to take over. Uh, talking about tools, one of the things that we talk about with tools is we can go around the room and everybody's gonna come up with something else that they can think of, right? Uh, you see airbags, you see saws, you see uh, pry bars, chainsaws, sawzalls, you name it. I mean, I'm sure everybody in this, uh, in this Zoom can come up with something else. And there's a lot of places that even have these fancy tarps laid out with, with RIT equipment. Uh, if this is your department, I apologize in advance, but uh, having a RIT picnic like this is probably my biggest pet peeve when it comes to rapid intervention and firefighter rescue. I don't need to set, set out my picnic basket slash Stokes basket full of crap that I drug two blocks down the street and lay it all out nice and neat on a tarp. Am I going to need airbags in probably 95% of the maydays that we're going to face at the fires that we're going to? Probably not. Even if I do need airbags, what can I do in the meantime to make sure that this guy makes it long enough that the airbags actually help? Air, right? Air is one thing we can always provide. So we can what if it all day long and say, we could use high lift jacks and we could use bottle jacks and we could use sawzalls and we, we could use all kinds of different things. And I'm not saying that anything, any one thing is right or wrong. All I'm saying is limit the equipment that you select in the initial stages of RIT because it's very easy to get sucked down that rabbit hole and, uh, and start just putting T taking everything off the rig that you can ever possibly think of. Me personally, I'm not a fan of using the Stokes basket at a house fire. Um, if we're assigned RIT, uh, I'm not a fan of getting the Stokes basket off to carry equipment because at that point, the Stokes basket just becomes a catch-all for more stuff. But if guys have to, are forced to carry the stuff that they're going to be carrying inside, typically they're not grabbing anything extra uh, above what the minimum requirements are. Also, not to mention if anybody's ever tried to use a Stokes basket inside of a house, uh, whether on an EMS call or a, uh, a firefighter down scenario, it's, it's not very uh, realistic. So commercial building, absolutely. But in a house fire, for example, I'm not going to take out the, uh, the Stokes basket to fill it full of crap. So really that all boils down to what do we need versus what might we need. So the uh, kind of the saying that we came up with was the big five. Uh, these five red tools, our safety bureau developed this list. Um, after Magnolia Street, they put out a paper and said, hey, look, these are the five things that you need to establish RIT. 
On top of this is going to be personal tools, right? Every firefighter is going to have a tool. Typically, it's going to be coordinated among the crew. You might have a couple guys with irons. You might have somebody with a hook, somebody with axes. But in addition to personal tools, we need to make sure that we have these five things. First would be that RIT pack. Do you have a 30-minute bottle? Do you have a 60-minute bottle? Uh, we run 60-minute bottles, and I think that's important, A, because it just buys us more time. It's not that much heavier in the bag. But B, and maybe even more importantly, is when you look at studies such as uh, Phoenix, right, where they found it's going to take 12 firefighters to rescue one, uh, one in every four or five fire firefighters that's responding as part of the mayday, the, as part of the RIT team, excuse me, is going to have an additional mayday. If I'm on RIT and I start running low on air, that could very well constitute a mayday. But if I have this RIT pack with me, can I transfill and give myself some air so I can at least A, make it out, or B, continue because we think the guy's right around the corner? Again, I'm not going to be the, uh, the little angel or the devil on your shoulder when you're in this situation, but it's something to think about. Should have a face piece with your RIT pack, right? So not every department can afford RIT packs. I understand that. Can you go to, go to a, uh, an engine on the scene and just grab an extra SCBA with a face piece? Is that going to work? Sure, absolutely. That gives you an option at least to give that down firefighter air should they need it. Do you keep the face piece pre-rigged like it is in this picture? We used to. This is an older picture of our RIT bag. And what we found through drills was when we left that face piece in the regulator pre-connected, two things would happen. One, uh, it would get bumped and it would start free flowing uh, a lot easier. Two, inevitably, the guy with the bag is never the first one to the down firefighter. So somebody else gets there. And they say, hey, he doesn't have a face piece. Give me a mask. So you go to extend that mask to that, uh, that other firefighter, and you're limited by that, uh, by that hose between uh, the mask mounted regulator and the first stage regulator. And it's just, it's a goat rodeo. So we found that it's actually a lot easier to put that mask in a bag. And now if somebody needs, they call for the mask, I can pull it out. And it's like, uh, it's like Justin Fields handing off yesterday, right? just shove it in his gut and he's going to run it down the middle. It's going to work great. Uh, ever since we switched to that on, uh, on our rip pack, it seems to work very, very well. Also uh, a transfill hose. So the UAC um, is pretty much our primary, I shouldn't say primary. That's our plan a, when it comes to getting that down firefighter air, what we found um, is a lot of times our guys are going to leave their face piece on. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we are trained from drill school and how we're taught to uh, manage uh, SCBA emergencies. Uh, we don't have time to get into that, but um, one of the things that we've done though, is we put an extension, a 20 or 25 foot extension on all of these RIT pack uh, transfill lines. So now we have 25-ish feet of reach with this thing. Does a couple things. One, again, I'm not the first, I got the bag, but I'm not the first guy to this uh, down firefighter. Um, Kristen, she calls for the, the transfill hose because this firefighter's got air on. So rather than trying to pass the entire bag to Kristen with only a two foot hose on it, I can take that UAC, the end of that hose, hand it to her. And now she can do it. Uh, she can transfill while I'm out of the way, the bag's out of the way. We're not creating a bird's nest, uh, in the tight spot that this firefighter inevitably found themselves in. Uh, also, um, on our SCBA spec we have an extra UAC. We have the one in the rear that every SCBA since 2002 has. We also have one on the chest that does two things. One, it makes it easier if that's, you come across a downed firefighter and that's the first uh, UAC that you find, you can use that. Or B, if I'm conscious, I fell into a floor and I'm, uh, I'm running low on air, RIT can lower that to me. If I'm not out of the hole by the time RIT gets there, RIT can lower that transfill hose to me. It's a lot easier to make that connection here than it is around my back. So just a couple things. You also notice that um, we keep our um, we keep our bags pretty simple. We we don't have a lot of extraneous stuff in there. The only thing, in addition to what you see here, kind of tucked under that face piece, is a uh, a mega mover, right? Like we would use for EMS. This one's a little bit more rugged. It's got some canvas on it. And uh, we have what we call a Henry light, which is a little LED road flare that we can use to mark egress. Uh, that's it. We don't carry any wire cutters. We don't carry any rope. We don't carry any webbing. We don't carry any of the other stuff that a lot of people uh, like to put in the rip bags. 
And this thing is literally just a giant double zipper wide mouth tool bag. There's nothing fancy about it. It doesn't have all kinds of little pockets and gadgets and doodads. It's very simple and easy to use. Uh, lastly, I, I should have put a picture in here, but I don't believe I did. Um, we've switched out the shoulder strap for um, old rope rescue pickoff straps. We, we do that. It allows us to do a harness conversion on this down firefighter without ever having to work with their waist belt. If anybody's ever tried doing that, it's a royal pain, right? Uh, anybody bigger than about five foot three and 130 pounds, it's, it's challenging. So now we don't even have to worry about ever undoing that waist strap. We can just click one end, click the other end, tighten it down. And now we've done a harness conversion. Uh, thermal imager, we found it's, it's best when the officer does, uh, the officer guides the search with that thermal imager. And a lot of times, if that officer isn't necessarily the first one in the door, um, if they're the first one in, a lot of times we found through training that uh, they're a little bit more tunnel vision in the camera versus if you went in as say a stack of four, for example, if they're more towards the rear, they have a little bit better situational awareness. They're watching what their crew members are doing. They're kind of directing them off to investigate certain things. Um, we're, all, we're always gonna have a rope with us. That could be to get a firefighter out of a hole, right? Um, to lower them maybe from an upper floor, but also it could serve as a trail of breadcrumbs in and out of the structure. So for us, it's not required on a residential um, or a house fire to use this in a writ activation to tie it off outside and, and be your search rope. But in a commercial occupancy, having a rope and or a hose line is gonna be required, right? I mean. Commercial occupancies are completely different from um, houses, as we're going to talk about later on. Uh, irons, uh, pretty self-explanatory, right? Forcible exit. Uh, just because you came in from point A doesn't mean that that's how you're going to take this firefighter out. Maybe this mayday occurred because there was a collapse, so now you're going to have to breach a wall to get into something, uh, get into another room maybe to evacuate this firefighter from. So. That picture there on the left, that's a pretty typical Toledo house. We did this uh, in some training for State Fire School, but uh, there's original lath and plaster, and then they put chicken wire lath over that and plastered over top of that. So you got two layers with chicken wire, uh, big old traditional two by fours and a balloon frame house. Pretty tough stuff, um, but we just have to make sure that somebody's got those irons. Obviously, they can always be used for um, forcing doors, uh, Pry and, security pry and security bars, excuse me, or forcing security gates. Um, we don't talk about uh, rotary saws or chainsaws or anything in this big five. That's all gonna be dependent on the situation, right? I mean, I'm not gonna tell you to bring a rotary saw or K-12 up as writ every single time if you don't really have many houses or anything that has bars on the windows in your first two area. So just know what uh, is common in your area and go with it. One of the things that we found on the squad is as the squad driver, I'll carry a little uh, DeWalt 60 volt battery operated angle grinder with a diamond wheel on it. That thing is, is awesome when it comes to uh, making a couple quick cuts for window bars, especially if I'm up on a porch roof or working off of a ladder. The last of the big five uh, tools is the hose line. We don't always have to bring the hose line in with us, but what we found is if this mayday occurs because of a thermal threat, right? Maybe guys are cut off by fire. They have some type of, mid uh, their line burns through. Um, there's a flashover, what have you. If we wait until the mayday is called to pull, figure out where to pull a line from, to pull it, flake it, charge it, bleed it, all that stuff, it's gonna be too late. You're not gonna have a chance. So what we'll do is we will pull a writ line, um, stage it typically in the front yard. Most times it won't be charged. Um, until we would have to go in, right? Because it might be easier to go in the side versus the front door. Um, but also, sometimes that RIT line gets charged and used by RIT on the exterior to limit spread, right? So if we have crews operating, maybe it's a duplex, uh, one up, one down, and there's fire um, venting out of a side window, getting up into the soffit, maybe starting to get into the second floor, a lot of times RIT will end up using that line in kind of a preventative mode to prevent a mayday from occurring by this fire getting up and behind uh, crews on the second floor or above them into the attic. Hey, Jake. Yes, sir. Do you guys have language on where that writ line comes from or is it like first engine in, second engine in? So that's, that's a good question. Um, what we do on our fires, uh, we have hydrants every couple hundred feet in the city for the most part. Um, so luckily we're pretty blessed when it comes to that. 
Typically the way our fires go is the first engine is going to go right to the fire. They're going to dump off the back step guys. They're going to pull a line and they're going to go inside, uh, start the attack on tank water. The second do engine <clears throat> is going to grab a hydrant on the way in. If the first do driver uh, can't hand stretch to a plug themselves. And this, the backup line will ideally come off that second do engine. What the, uh, what the two first engines will do is uh, what's called dual pumping, right? So, that supply line from the second do engine actually goes into the first do engine, right? That's the attack line. That's where we're worried about having that positive water supply. Then we'll take a three inch line from auxiliary intake to auxiliary intake between the first and the second. So the second do engine gets the, the residual hydrant pressure, right? And then, so attack off the first engine, back up off the second one. Then really, you'll, there's a couple different uh, trains of thought here. Some people are saying, uh, that the writ line should come off the attack line, off the attack engine, right? The first two engine, because ideally if something happened to the first line, hopefully backup would be able to get it with the second line. And that's the rig that is still attached to the hydrant. Sometimes it's going to come off the second do because people figure, well, if something happened to the first two engine, I want to make sure that I still have two lines in operation. But to be honest with you, it probably only boils down to which rig is easier to pull it off of, mm -hmm. depending on placement. Um, is it on the corner? Uh, all of our lines come off the rear. We don't have any cross lays. Mm -hmm. So that definitely plays in, plays into your selection off those first two engines. So there's no hard and fast rule, but there are some considerations that are going to go into it, um, depending on the situation at hand. So sorry for kind of a long winded answer, but there's not, no, that's it's not concrete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, any any other questions or anything? I'm not seeing them pop up because uh, I got everything minimized. Um, nothing popped up in the chats. Like I said, guys, uh, if you have questions, please throw them in the chats. Unmute yourself, ask it, remute, and then we'll 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 get them to you. All right, right on. Um, talking about the RIT playbook. So for us, um, our RIT procedure is pretty open ended, and it allows crews a lot of flexibility in how they want to staff RIT themselves. Um, different crews are going to do things a little bit differently, but for the most part, um, crews are going to be, be pretty similar when it comes to deployment and um, some of the techniques that they're going to use. So um, if you can predetermine your assignments, and it doesn't have to be down to like every minute detail, but at least have some common language that everybody can understand, the common equipment, we just talked about that, and some common tasks as well. So for us, um, all of our RIT, uh, all of our RIT bags have a, a RIT whiteboard like this. And to be honest with you, they sit at the bottom of the RIT bag and don't come out very often. Because for your average house fire, uh, this would be a little bit too much, um, to be honest with you, in most cases, when it's just as easy for that RIT officer to um, keep eyes on the structure and, and listen to the radio than it is to kind of be back at the command post filling this thing out. But with that being said, on any second alarm or greater fire, uh, maybe a commercial fire or a uh, large apartment fire, you're going to see um, a lot of times that RIT officer pull this uh, worksheet out and start filling it out just so they can keep a better track of where everybody is. Sometimes you'll see the, uh, the safety officer. We have a, a lieutenant on duty every single day uh, who drives around in a Tahoe and it is their duty to go to any major incident in the city and be the safety officer. Sometimes you'll see them fill this out as well. So what we've done at my crew, and uh, we find that this works pretty well, is we determine the assignments based on your position for the day. So all of these are going to have a tool assigned to them. They're going to have a position assigned. And this is in addition to whatever uh, personal tools you have that, that you've organized or orchestrated among your crew. So for us, that officer is going to be positioned somewhere on side alpha. Their responsibility is the thermal imager along with their personal tool. Firefighter one, again, this is just my crew and, and kind of how we've decided to break this up. Firefighter one is that alpha assessment firefighter. So they're also going to be positioned somewhere on the alpha side. And in a perfect world, it would be their job to assess that down firefighter, figure out what the issues are, fix them so we can get them out. They're going to be responsible for getting that rope bag and a personal tool. Firefighter two. So firefighter one and firefighter two are typically the two backstep firefighters uh, on our engine companies. Uh, we have to have a, uh, 
a four person crew is writ. So uh, truck companies and rescue squads won't be assigned writ. Uh, we only have three on our trucks and, and on the rescues. So only an engine will be assigned writ. Um, Firefighter two, Bravo breathing is how we remember that at 7B. Um, you're gonna be positioned somewhere on the Bravo side of that structure. Their, their job is breathing. Their job is the writ pack plus a personal tool, right? So getting that thing out, turning it on. We only carry writ packs on our truck companies and on our rescue squads. So it's more often than not, the engine has not seen that writ pack today, yesterday, maybe even for the past three or four tours, they may have not seen that writ pack. So when we go to establish writ, whoever is that firefighter too, they pull that bag out, they open it up, they turn the bottle on, make sure there's air, make sure the face piece is there, make sure the transfill is there, make sure everything's good. Typically we tell guys to leave that bottle on because I don't wanna have to think about turning the bottle on uh, in the heat of the moment. I wanna make sure that that bottle's already on. And then we'll pull that transfill hose out of the bag, maybe about a foot. And typically whoever that firefighter two is, is gonna sling that rip pack over their shoulder and they're gonna crawl with that transfill hose capped in their hand, kind of like this. So that way, when they get to the down firefighter, there's no fumbling around for it. They literally already have it in their hand and they can just extend it out and either use it themselves or give it to another firefighter to uh, apply. And then the last firefighter, uh, what we call Delta damage, typically the driver, just because driver Delta damage all, all uh, go together. There are a lot of times to be positioned somewhere on the Delta side and their job is egress, right? Damage, what do we need to do? Do we need to blow through a wall? Do we need to force doors? Do we need to get some window bars cut off? Sometimes we'll run into interior window bars. Uh, do we need to coordinate a ladder getting brought around maybe to the rear to get this firefighter out? So their job is to make sure they have a set of irons. That, that is their personal tool in this case. Um, and then if that hose line needs to be brought in, they'll dump the irons and they're gonna be responsible for that uh, inch and three quarter attack line. So one thing that's gonna differ in how all these, uh, these assignments are put into play is the type of building you're going to, right? So these story and a half houses on the left that are a dime a dozen in Toledo, they're right on top of each other. Um, the, the fence is maybe eight feet from the street and it's another 20 feet to the front door. Uh, they all have a pretty common layout, pretty easy to figure out. We're going to operate a lot differently there than we are on a four or five story walk up like we have on the right. Um, we've got a whole block of these. Um, we've had a history of some pretty good fires in these. We pre plan these because they're, they're pretty tough. At this, we're probably not going to split up RIT. We're probably going to operate as one crew the entire time just by the sheer size of this structure and the complications as far as there's different part, there's three different staircases in this structure and you can't reach one part from the other part. So it's a mess. And that's knowing your structures is definitely gonna have to play a part in how you approach RIT. One of the other things we're gonna do is soften the structure. So kind of like I mentioned before, uh, is there window bars that we need to remove? Um, is there plywood board ups? Uh, one of the concerns we'll have a lot of times for plywood board ups is I need to remove this to make things safe for guys to get out, but I also don't want to increase, uh, I don't want to increase the air I'm giving the fire by pulling these board ups off. How can I limit the flow path? So could I be, could it be something as simple as forcing a rear door? Uh, I was off, but a good friend of mine uh, that I work with, uh, they ran a fire about a year ago. He goes around, he forces the rear door, always checking for those uh, alternate access and egress points uh, when it comes to um, firefighter rescue, but also for civilian and manages to force the door, drops down real quick, takes his flashlight, looks underneath the smoke and sees the victim inside the kitchen uh, about 10 feet from the door. So um, it, it, you can't really go wrong when it comes to softening the structure. RIT for us is always gonna throw an egress ladder, a minimum of one, preferably two, and preferably an extension ladder. So every engine in Toledo carries a 24 foot extension ladder and that is on the rig on the outside. So our ladders are on the side of the rig and the roof ladder is on the inside with the extension ladder on the outside. The main reason for that is it just gives us more options, whether it's a, a two-story house, three-story, maybe it's an apartment building, uh, maybe it's a, the roof of a two-story uh, commercial. That extension ladder, by nature of it extending, gives us a lot of options that the roofer doesn't. So it might be easier to throw a roofer just because it's lighter, but 
uh, what we do is we'll always throw that 24 first just because it gives us options. And then where do you throw it? A lot of times we'll see crews throw it to port troops like this, and uh, they typically get a pretty stern talking to from the chief or the safety officer afterwards if this is what they do, because that's just laziness. They're throwing it to, to the easiest point because typically the front porch is closest to the rigs. When in reality, if the fire's in the back, that's probably where the ladder should be going, right? We need the ladder where guys are in the most danger, not where it's easiest for RIT to do it. Not to mention, if I did have to bail out of that uh, front port or out of those front windows, excuse me, I could hang out on that front porch for quite a while and allow somebody to bring me a ladder at that point. That front porch itself is an area of refuge, so don't, don't overlook that. Do you take the windows? I can't tell you that. Sometimes it's going to depend on maybe I threw the ladder to a window that was already vented by the fire or by crews that were inside, but is, the, um, is there water on the fire? Does it seem like these guys uh, inside have a pretty good knock on the fire? Or do they not? I, again, flow pass. I don't want to create a flow path that could endanger the guys inside. So most of the time, we'll probably err on the side of caution and not take windows unless we're asked to. Um, but even if we want to, a lot of times we'll coordinate that with the interior crews just to make sure that they're okay with it. And then we'll announce that egress location. So that RIT officer would get on the radio and they would say, RIT to command, uh, secondary means of egress, ladder, division two, side Charlie. And then command will typically repeat that to all units on the fire ground, just so everybody has heard it twice, where they know that uh, that egress ladder is. Or they might say, we've got an egress ladder on side Bravo, and there's an airing deck in the rear on side Charlie. Boom, that's, that's, that's great. You know there's two options right now. Or we have a front porch roof and an airing deck in the back. We're throwing a ladder on the Delta side. So whatever it is, just communicate. Communication is going to be huge uh, when it comes to uh, dealing with those egress situations. So one of the big things that came out of our uh, review of Magnolia Street was RIT positioning. Traditionally, this is, this is RIT, right? It's a bunch of guys standing in the front yard around a uh, Stokes basket full of stuff or a RIT picnic. And it's one spot with four or five guys and you're just waiting for something bad to happen. Whether you do proactive RIT and you're putting hand lights down and chasing kinks and throwing ladders and forcing doors, even if you're doing all that stuff, you're kind of handicapped yourself by all sitting in one spot. So you might have noticed earlier when I talked about RIT uh, assignments and duties for that four person engine crew, I mentioned that each person's kind of gonna be on a different side. So one of the things that came from our line of duty death review um, was a new way to kind of stage for RIT or deploy for RIT. So just an aerial view of your very basic block house here. One of the uh, methods that our crews can use is called, we call it the two by two. So it's two teams of two in two different spots. They're gonna be in opposite corners of the, uh, of the structure. And what this does is this allows us to get a continuous 360 of this structure at all times. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might want a continuous 360, whether it's a small house fire or even a larger fire. Um, maybe it is a larger apartment building, but like I mentioned, one of the considerations we have in a commercial or an apartment building, anything different than maybe a house is how far apart are we now? And what's the experience of your crew? Uh, what's the situation? How well progressed is the fire? There's a lot of considerations that need to be, uh, be discussed, I guess, basically before it even happens. We also have the four by one. We have four guys all in their own spot. So as you can see here, it's pretty similar. Also gives us a full 360 degree view of the structure and gives us a lot of flexibility when it comes to deployment. Um, if firefighter two and firefighter three in the rear, they see, uh, they hear a mayday in the second floor. Uh, somebody's cut off by fire. They know they can get to them. Can they climb the ladder that they just threw, go up and pull this guy out? Or can they just roll a ladder to a different window um, where this firefighter might be at waiting to bail out? rather than having to go back up to the front, meet up with the officer and firefighter one and going in together as an elephant train. I can't, hey, uh, we could what if every scenario, but, and again, it's gonna depend on your procedures and your crew, but it just, it gives you so many more options than having four people out in the front yard. Yeah, do you have something, Jordan? Yeah, uh, I just, I kind of two questions on this. When you guys set up this, this RIT platform, 
do you guys benchmark RIT to command like, hey, we're in position on each side of the building? And then how do you guys do accountability then? Like in this situation, this slide here, you have a firefighter in each corner and then they call for a PAR check. Is that, are those guys going to the officer saying, hey, we're good, and then the officer relays it? Or is each one saying, hey, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in position, I'm good to go? So the, the RIT officer will be doing most of the talking on the radio unless there's some issue that needs addressed. Um, so the RIT officer, like you, the crew isn't just gonna do this willy nilly. The officer's typically gonna explain, hey, I want you guys split up like this. Um, if it's lucky enough, like for me, I luckily don't have to go across the city and, and cover at a lot of other engine houses um, like a lot of people do. So working with a different officer, they're going to have different uh, opinions. Some like the four by one, some like two by two. Mm -hmm. um, and they're all going to kind of have a different way to uh, that they run that. So typically, yes, the officer is going to announce over the radio. Uh, they're going to say RIT 360 in place because that officer has to do a 360. So the RIT officer typically does the 360 while the rest of the crew is assembling the equipment. And then he's going to kind of split them up uh, based on what he or she sees. So they're doing the 360. They're going to say where they want the ladder. They're going to say um, kind of where they want guys to hang out. Maybe you say, hey, we need this door forced. We need that door forced. Let's consider getting a second line. Uh, maybe there's a, maybe the, the drop fell off the house and there's an energized line on the, the fence. So now the officer's like, hey, make before you do anything else, make sure nobody touches this fence. I'm gonna go grab some caution tape. I'll be right back, right? Mm -hmm. That's some some of the preemptive things that you might think would be fall more on a safety officer, but they may or may not be there yet. Um, so it's it's really adaptable. But then when it comes to par checks, the good thing is in the four by one at least is each person can see three other people. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you look at this one, like the officer go, looks over to firefighter one and says, hey, are you guys, are you too good? Uh, is, is Ryan still over there? And firefighter one's like, yep, yeah, he's over there. Perfect. Now he's got that par. Um, it doesn't typically go out over the radio. Um, and then, um, yeah, typically as far as accountability when you deploy, again, that's really going to depend on the experience of the crew, how well they work together. What I can do with the crew that I work with every single day versus what I'll do if I'm on overtime and assigned writ on an engine somewhere right. is going to be completely different just for the accountability, uh, just for that accountability reason itself. Hey, Jay. Yes, sir. And remember, this is, this is probably the most critical phase of this operation because now you're in the monitoring phase because this is where the writ team is basically in the same mindset as what a safety officer would be. They are looking, they're reading the building, they're assuring the tactical objectives are being carrying out the right way. They're maintaining accountability. Um, you know, this is a, a very important piece of the RIT operation. I think this is the, the piece for what we do where we see the most value uh, when it comes down to uh, recognizing a potential situation that might go the wrong way. Um, so there, there's a lot to this as far as uh, the reading the building and monitoring what it is that they're doing in this P here. Accountability is not, uh, crew accountability is easy because we only do this on residentials because we don't want to be too spread out. But we can visually see each other uh, in this scenario as far as crew accountability. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Lute. I think, um, I think it's huge just that continuous 360 um, that goes on. Uh, one of the stories that I, that I kind of talk about here, um, I'm not sure if you remember the fire, but uh, it was on B-Shift a couple summers ago. Um, Engine 16 on B-Shift, as you know, uh, some really good experienced firefighters. Um, long story short, uh, it got a little hairy for a while. Uh, they got pushed back down the stairs, the, the two guys on the line. Uh, the radio fell out of one firefighter's pocket, and the second firefighter forgot his radio in the rig. They were uh, he just he just blanked out, and so command was trying to make contact with attack. And uh, just as the RIT officer is doing his 360, he sees a window get punched out by somebody's helmet. And so I'm pretty sure that everybody here could probably agree that seeing someone's helmet getting punched through a window is probably a universal sign for help, kind of like the choking symbol. So he called the mayday. Ended up th these guys were fine, no harm, no foul. They weren't burnt. They weren't anything else. But 
I, I tell that story just as the, if, if there wasn't anybody around the back and they didn't even have a chance to get writ set up yet. But if we're, if we can't do that continuous 360 at house fires, you're, you're missing out on a lot of things that if everybody's in the front yard, you're not going to see. And obviously the chief can't be everywhere at once. So not every department's lucky enough like we are to have a safety officer on every call um, or on every working incident. I'm sorry. So by splitting up RIT, you're really maximizing the use and the effectiveness of your RIT team, not only in, uh, in firefighter rescue, like the, the traditional sense of going in and grabbing somebody and yanking them out, but also like, like Lieutenant K said, when it comes to preventing things just by noticing changes or things not changing, whether it's smoke conditions, uh, structural conditions. I, I mean, there's so many things that, that uh, I believe the split RIT concept like this, I, I think the, the benefits are far greater than, uh, than any cons, in my opinion. And it is, and, and, and we have the statistical data that proves that because most, you know, it's common now on your initial size of to do a 360, is it not? Yep. And the question you have to ask is, let's go back to the basics. When does a 360, when does size up ever end? It doesn't. And when you look at the dynamics and the potential changes of these fire ground environments, when you have firefighters looking at the building in this four corners, what are they really doing? It's a constant 360 of every corner of the building at every single second of the fire. And I can tell you from experience as a Toledo safety officer, I can think of distinctively five situations where I truly felt that the safety of a firefighter was definitely in peril. And all those five scenarios that I can think of in my head right now, every one of those potential situations was recognized by a RIT firefighter holding his position and identified a potential problem and either A, had the courage to get on the radio and say something about it or brought it to my attention as a safety officer where we could immediately take action and we most definitely adverted a tough situation because you just can't be everywhere at one point. These fires are so different, rapidly changing, so dynamic. There's so much going on today that you have to have this component all the time. And it definitely has worked in our favor. I can say it for Toledo, for sure. L Lieutenant K and, and Jake, you guys can definitely answer this. Does this create more of a buy-in? Because, you know, like, you know, the old school way of writ where you're standing in the front yard, you're told you're writ, you know, you're, your engagement of the fire goes away. Are the guys more engaged in, in that situational awareness is still hyped up when you do this four to one and this uh, two, two to one? Absolutely. We're doers. Are we not? Yeah. Firefighters are doers. To be part of the situation, you have to become part of the situation. That means you have to be engaged in what's taking place. Standing out in front, watching everybody work, you have to question the, the, the mindset. And that's what we did. We were doing this before Magnolia mm -hmm. because I knew from our experience that when we were standing out front, some crews were, but we did not have that 100% mental engagement of what's mm -hmm. taking place. By getting the RIT crew involved in some tactical things and doing this, they become part of the incident. They are forced to know what's going on. They know where the crews are working, where they're at, what they're doing, and if something goes wrong, they're all over it because they know, they know exactly what's taking place. And yeah, and that piece was, that's a big part of it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think our, um, the, the buy-in uh, definitely, uh, like I said, prior to Magnolia, a lot of times it was, when we go to house fires, those were all, that was a supermarket fire. We're not going to grocery store fires all that often. And we hadn't lost a firefighter in the line of duty at an actual house fire in so long that we had gotten a lot, that we had gotten pretty complacent in writ, right? Everybody, like the Lieutenant said, everybody's a doer. Everybody wants to be the guy inside on the line, doing a search, hook and ceiling on the roof, whatever it is. And by, by really transitioning these guys from more or less an educated bystander role in the front yard at the sidewalk to an engaged role on the fire ground, um, I, I think that definitely keeps them uh, better mentally prepared and better engaged. But also, I think um, I, I think it it gives them it gives them buy-in, but it also it also gives them a little bit of uh, 
I don't know what the word is I'm saying. I don't want to say pride, but like it gives them a little something to do, right? Like mm-hmm. they're, nobody wants to, nobody wants to be a sign writer. I'll just throw that out there right now. No matter what anybody says, everybody would much rather be inside. I can tell you that after Magnolia Street, most people that I work with, at least, our feelings changed a lot to where, uh, for us, the fourth due engine in the running order is assigned writ automatically from dispatch. And that can change given a couple circumstances. But for the most part, it, it automatically it stays that way most times. And for about three, nah, maybe three or four seconds, you're like, ah, we're writ. And then it's like, all right, you flip the switch. And now you're getting in that mindset from the get-go. So yeah. you're in that mindset the entire way there. Hey, what do the houses look like on that street? Where are the hydrants? Are the houses close together? Uh, am I going to need a 24 or a 35 to, to reach the second and third floors of these places? Um, are there any tricky forceful entry problems over there? Are there exterior staircases? All those things that, that since we assign writ from dispatch, once you get past the three-second delay of, oh, man, I wish we were actually going inside and doing something, you just flip the switch and you kind of get in that mindset. And I think it works really, really well. So let's take Jake. Uh, this, this is the one thing I wanted to, to hit. I don't know if you want to do this later on in the presentation, but take setting up this RIT platform in the rural and suburban setting where at least where I work, you know, we're not getting the run cards like you guys are mm-hmm. for, for an engine company. So, you know, I might be three or four mutual aid departments in, before I get a true writ established, um, how how quick do I want this eyes on all four sides? How, what's your guys' time frame for you guys to get it set up, and how can we make that work in the rural setting? I would say our time frame for that is probably um, it's going to vary. Uh, I mean, like some of the outlying areas of the city, uh, companies aren't as densely positioned as they are. Uh, in the inner city. But um, I mean, in a lot of cases, we're so densely, we're we're so close together in the inner city where if if I'm driving the engine, for example, and I make one wrong turn, that could be the difference between being first due and fourth due. Mm -hmm. Like, so a lot of times that writ's getting set up really fast, but that that can change depending on our crews out on other runs. Are they on an EMS run? Are they assisting on the way to the hospital? Are they at training? Are they at the store? So there's a lot of variables there that I don't, I don't know I could ever give you like a, a firm time. I'm sure we could find an average, but I think as, as volunteer rural departments, suburban departments, I think, I think what this really does is it gives you something to do later on, right? It gives you something to shoot for when you, whenever you do get rid established. But like you just said, I mean, you, you might be pretty well into the firefight before you even have two people to spare, right? Let alone four to do this. So we, that's why I think we need to change the mindset entirely. You need right. to start empowering those interior crews to, to make a difference for that down firefighter. Because again, 80 some percent of the time, it's either them, their crew, or somebody else on the inside that's making first contact with them. So what can we do to improve the survivability and improve RIT operations? I would say we improve RIT operations by improving self-survival skills and just training and empowering your people to say, Hey, if, if you think you can do something to help this guy do it because there's nobody else there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then to, to kind of supplement that before Rick gets there, if all you can do is put a couple crews inside of the house, whether you have a Rick or you just have to take an extra SCBA and a mask out of the, out of the rig, go throw it up on the front porch or near the front door. Right. So even absolute worst case scenario, you have one or two crews there, something happens somebody can hopefully run outside, grab that thing right off the porch and go right back in. So in, in the limited manpower uh, world of, of the rural fire service, I think this, it, it's, this still holds true, I, th- I think, as a good concept. But how do, we, how do we stress that if we don't have all the people? Again, it's, it's by really empowering your people to, uh, to make good decisions inside that they think can, can help out also being aware of the fire conditions and, and everything else, but, um, and just focusing on self-survival skills. If I can start uh, resolving this mayday myself, so maybe I get myself half untangled and then Jordan, you show up and you cut me the rest of the way out because you were just one or two rooms down the hall doing a search, perfect, right? Like we don't have to wait for the magical RIT team to show up out of the sky and fix everything. So you good, good with that? 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, All right. I, I, I love this concept because – and it's like uh, Lieutenant K said, you, you have eyes on all four sides. And, you know, I when I'm doing my stuff, I always say the Charlie side is one of the most dangerous sides because you don't get eyes on there right away. You know, it could be one condition on the front side and totally different on the back, and you don't catch it. It's I, I love this idea, and I'm trying to figure out how to implement it into a Lima, Ohio – Allen yeah. County Fire Service. You know, it's unfortunately we we, and again, it's it's your demographics. Sometimes we show up with all eight of our firefighters on shift, and sometimes we show up with one guy, one truck. <laughs> yes, yeah. no, I get it. Just the nature. Jordan, of the I can I can tell you what we did in Toledo. If you if you're familiar with what's what what's going on out there, this is the safety engine concept. Okay. This is the safety engine concept that we modified it to make it work for us. And in my opinion, because I am a chief of a small volunteer department, but also a safety officer on a larger department, that, that system, that concept is ideal for the volunteer setting. Mm -hmm. If you pre-plan it, have good mutual aid relationships, automatic aid relationships, what most small departments do, by Training the safety engine concept, you can fulfill a lot of writ sector assignments with safety officer components, crew set to do this. You can fulfill uh, those different positions. Uh, it's a great concept if you need to break it down to the smaller department setting. It's mm -hmm. doable and it's workable. You just got to get out and do it. Yep, and and it's the relationships. And I, I, I can speak for Allen County. We've changed our mutual aid quite a bit. We just got a new dispatching software we're creating the box systems and um uh, yeah i'm definitely taking notes on that because i i really like that the safety engine concept cool well i'll i'll go through this next little bit here too because yes. this um kind of dovetails right into what we're talking about as far as how do we justify changing the way we do things the way we've always done things um so looking at project mayday uh, by their stats, 86% of the maydays are due to one of these four things. Somebody's low on air, out of air, had a mass malfunction, something with their air. They fell through or off of a roof or into a basement or they're lost. So out of those things, right, none of those really involve advanced skills or specialized equipment or training to fix, right? I mean, those are all fairly straightforward mayday events. So what do we need to know before we go inside? Or if you are inside already, what do you need to know before you decide, can I go try to find this guy? Or do I need to stay here and just radio out to command what we have? Who's calling the Mayday? Where are they at? And what's the problem, right? If I can answer those three things, plus if I'm outside, what's the fastest way to get there? Just because attack went in through the front door doesn't necessarily mean that's gonna be the fastest way for me to get there. If I can answer these couple questions, I'm pretty well on my way to getting inside. One of the, one of the things that um, a lot of these studies show is it takes so long for RIT crews to get inside the structure. I'm not a proponent of, of doing RIT with my face piece on. Uh, if here in Toledo, if you're on the first or the second do engines or the, uh, the heavy rescue, you're pretty much going to get off the rig. Uh, if you're in the back of that rig, you're getting off with your face piece on. Um, I know there's a lot of people that feel pros and cons in that. Um, and a lot of people say you can't size up the structure. Uh, I, I don't know about that. I, I feel like we can size up the structure just fine looking through my face piece. Uh, it doesn't really fog up. I don't really have any issues with that. But it's more of a selfish thing because everybody's so fast that if I didn't do that, I'd never see the inside of a burning building. So when I'm doing RIT though, I'm not a fan of leaving my face piece on because then yes, that's where it's going to get fogged up. It's going to be a pain in the, it's going to be a pain in the ass to to, to clear and, and to get on and figure out. So practice gearing up and, and putting your face piece on with your gloves on and doing it quickly, right? How do we minimize the time from the May Day to RIT getting inside? Um, I, th I think that's huge. But then also, again, like we've talked throughout this entire thing, can the interior crews respond to this? Again, that's gonna depend on the fire conditions, the building construction uh, and the occupancy. How long have we been operating? Uh, what's the experience of the crews inside? What's the experience of the RIC crew? And then where is this mayday? Um, if somebody fell into the basement, you can kind of see in this picture, I didn't point it out very well, but 
Um, there's a side door on this house. Almost every single house in the inner city of Toledo has a side door or a rear door that is a couple steps up into the kitchen and about seven or eight or 10 steps down into the basement. So if we have guys at every corner and somebody falls into the basement, why would I ever go in through the front door when I know that somewhere there's a large hole in the floor and there's already people inside when I can very easily go to that side door and know I have direct access to that down firefighter. Maybe crews accidentally went over a basement fire. Now we can bring a line in that way. We're not, go, we're not operating above it. it. Just different things like that. It really boils down to conditions, experience, and location. So uh, there's little subsets to each of those, but conditions, experience, and location are really uh, the meat and potatoes of that, that question, really. Um, when you're trying to locate them, use clues from radio traffic or other units on the inside. Uh, bring that thermal imager along with you. I'm going to kind of skip through some of this so we can get to the commercial stuff. Um, when you find that down firefighter, please shut the pass device off so everybody can hear and understand you on the radio. Uh, shut their pass off and, and try to be mindful of that. Um, see, check their, their condition, right? Are they entangled? Do they have air? Do they have a face piece on? Are they breathing? Do they have any air left in their tank? Do whatever it is that you're going to need to do. Uh, transfills, mask changeovers, whatever it is. Do a full body sweep to make sure they're not entangled or pinned or otherwise uh, entrapped. Um, I put a little note in there about one firefighter techniques. I'm a huge fan of doing anything that I can by myself, whether it's a 24 foot ladder throw, forcing a door or doing a face piece swap on a down firefighter. It is so much easier to do it by yourself than it is to try to coordinate with somebody, especially in high stress, zero visibility, high heat, it's just not realistic. So I'm a big fan of one firefighter techniques for all those things. I, I find that it just works a lot better. Do you give that firefighter air or not? Just because you brought the rip bag doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use it. And then also on the flip side of that, if you're an interior crew, some departments carry a little transfill hose on their SCBA. I know we have two for every four seats on the rig. Two of them are going to have a, a small little three foot transfill hose. If I'm in here doing a search and I find somebody else, I call a mayday for them, they're unconscious. Do I have to give them air? No, I don't have to. One of the big things is how long is it to your egress? And not necessarily how you got into the building, but just the, the closest available egress. How long have they been down? What is their air status? Do they have a face piece or not? All of these things can really boil down to, think about a house, whether it's your house, the average house you go into, anything short of a McMansion, and even in a lot of cases, those as well, you're never further than about 15 feet from a window. Uh, in my little home office right here, I have a window about four feet to my right, another one about four feet to my left, and I can see, I think, four others from here. So you're never very far from a window. So if I'm inside, I may not have a rip pack. Maybe this guy's out of air. Maybe, maybe he's missing his face piece, whatever. Can I drag this firefighter into a room after calling a mayday for him, isolate, close the door, take out the window. Can I flop their chest out of the, out of the window and, and wait for a ladder to show up? Sure. Have I fixed a lot of the problem? Yeah, I have. So all these things are things to consider that we could definitely go back and forth on for a long time about, but it definitely things to talk about with your crew. Um, I'm not a fan of, of always or never in any aspect of the fire service. Some people in procedures are gonna say that you always have to package uh, the down firefighter, you always have to do a harness conversion, or you always have to do something. A couple things to think about, just realize that you don't have to do that. If that's gonna delay your removal, maybe don't do it. If I know I have a long distance to travel with this firefighter, it's probably gonna save me a little bit of time to take 30 seconds now to save five minutes over the, the exit, especially in maybe a commercial occupancy or, or a, larger, uh, a larger place like an apartment building. Um, so one of the studies, uh, this study came out of, uh, British Columbia, Canada, and they were evaluating, uh, writ effectiveness in times. And they found that it took a trained four person writ team four and a half minutes to package and lift an unconscious firefighter through a window. The firefighter was in the same room as the window. The, the clock started, they said go, and they had to package and remove the firefighter. Four and a half minutes seemed like a long time to anybody else because four and a half minutes is a very long time. And this was the average. They had some that were faster, some that were slower. So what can we do to make our lives easier, whether you're responding in as writ or you are just a 
another interior crew trying to get somebody out. I'm sure most people have done the Denver drill before. Um, the Denver drill is a fantastic uh, skill and it's a fantastic drill. Um, please, if you've never done it, look into it. Firefighter Mark Langvart in Denver in 1992 died in, uh, in a very tight, cramped condition. And there's some great techniques that came out of that. But not every situation is going to be like that. I, I've never seen that in, in my house or in an average house that we go to, anything close to that. So what are some other things we can do? Here, this is us uh, demonstrating with some of our rookies how you can slide an axe handle or maybe a halogen bar or even a pike pole or whatever tool you have underneath the chest of a firefighter. This works great for burnout slimy civilians as well. Get them up and out the window onto a ladder. Um, doing a second, a second floor removal, a lot of people default to a, a high point anchor, right? Like a, a high to, uh, redirect with a rope and a two to one system and all this stuff. And, and it's great, especially if you have it pre-rigged. I know a lot of places do. Columbus, Cincinnati, I believe, both have it uh, pre-rigged on their rigs. We don't have it here. Um, and to be honest with you, we found that it was a lot faster to just do a window cut down off the ladder, like you see there on the right, than it was for guys to try to remember how to do the rope work. So it's not in what's going to look cool for Facebook. It's really what boils down to is what is the best option to give this guy the best chance at surviving this incident. Uh, and then we do our training. And really this boils down to for anything, whether it's writ, it's extrication, it's search, your training just has to be realistic, practical, and challenging. It doesn't have to take three hours. It could, it could be a 20 minute drill. And if it's realistic, practical, and challenging, somebody's gonna get something out of it. It's gonna be worth their time. They're not gonna bitch about training and your whole team is going to improve. It's gonna be baby steps. It's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You're not just gonna magically get better because you did an eight hour drill versus a 30 minute drill. So one of the things I talk about when people say we're too busy to drill or we don't have anywhere to train, right? Like most of our firehouses do not have any training facilities. I can only think of maybe two or three. So what does every firehouse have though? Fire trucks of some sort. Can you put a down firefighter underneath an engine and set off the pass alarm and make guys go search for him in zero visibility and then figure out his problem, maybe transfill him underneath the rig and then drag him out from underneath the rig? Sure. Does that add a level of realism and challenge to your drill? Absolutely. So, um, like I said before, self self rescue skills are writ skills, especially if we want to uh, if we want to kind of adopt that inside out concept to where writ really needs to start from the inside, and uh, the guys standing outside are the cavalry. Self survival skills need to be at the forefront of any training. So what do you carry in your pockets? You got a guy who falls through a floor, maybe he's conscious, maybe he's not. Can we start removing this firefighter before we even, uh, before, may, before Rit might even be inside the structure? Sure. What do you carry in your pockets? Do you have webbing? Do you have rope? However you carry uh, whatever it is that's in your pockets, make sure you understand why you carry it and B, how you can use it. So when it comes to training, keep in mind, there's a lot of these skills that are very perishable, but are also very easy to practice. Something, things that we call app floor drills, anything with a bag, any type of bag work, mask swaps, transfills, um, the harness conversion with the, uh, with the pickoff strap. How do we access and assess them? Again, like I said, throw them underneath of a rig if you need to. Uh, different drags, all this stuff you can do on the apparatus floor of any firehouse. It doesn't matter if it's one story, two stories, volunteer career, Easy stuff to do. If you're lucky enough and get some vacant ho vacant houses to uh, or structures to use, that's where you get to get lucky and practice on some of the window cut downs and pulling people out of windows, making holes in floors, doing alternate exits, doing full speed scenarios. When we do that, a lot of times we'll integrate RIT with our interior crews. So interior crews will already be operating. A mayday will go out. They will start. Um, they will start to affect a rescue or at least try to locate that down firefighter as RIT is coming in. So um, just try to make your, your training as realistic as you can. And don't be afraid to play what if. This was at State Fire School a couple of years ago and we talked about doing some second floor window cut downs, but we ran out of time. And a couple guys had some questions. They said, hey, what if we tried this? What if we tried this? And we said, you know what? If you want to hang out after class, we are more than willing to, uh, to figure this out because yeah, we want to know too. So don't be afraid to play what if and try to try to come up with new ways to try really any part of, of our job, whether it's writ, 
uh, or otherwise. And so really the big, the takeaways from this are you have to update that RIT mindset, especially Jordan, as you said, uh, in the rural environment, volunteer staffing with minimal response. Um, if we really empower the people that are inside to start making a difference, then you're not putting all your eggs in one basket with uh, the RIT team standing outside. Please, for the love of God, avoid that RIT picnic in the front yard. I hate seeing a tarp in the front yard for RIT. Uh, even a Stokes basket, like I said, on a house fire, completely unnecessary most times um, for the amount of stuff that we actually need. Having some predetermined assignments in that RIT playbook really helps avoid any confusion. And then as long as your training is realistic, practical, and challenging, you can't go wrong. It doesn't matter if you're cutting cars or uh, doing window removals. As long as it's realistic, practical, and challenging, you're going to be uh, you're going to be just fine, and you're going to be always improving. So that's all I got for uh, this part. So there's my info. If anybody wants it, um, feel free to get a hold of me anytime. I'm not going anywhere yet. I'm sure we still have some questions. And then uh, Jordan also wanted to talk about um, wanted to talk about uh, commercials. So we can talk about commercial occupancies as well, but. Uh, in the meantime, anybody got any questions, comments, concerns, hatreds, anything? I can take it. Um, I did get an email question, Jake. Let me find it real quick. Hold on. Um, this is from, well, I think we kind of talked about it already about um, listening and monitoring. Uh, this uh, individual emailed and said, uh, I listen to and monitor several structure fires in our area and very really rarely do I hear departments set up a writ sector. Um, why is it in the suburban and, and rural setting that we're not hearing them establish this over the radio um, is basically the question. I'll, let me read it. So I listen to and monitor several structure fires in our area and very rarely do I hear departments set up a writ sector. Jake always shares great info, but rarely do I hear the suburban department set up a writ sector. Most departments auto aid with their neighboring departments. I was just curious as to reasons why. Um, I, in my <laughs> neck of the woods, we have a love-hate relationship with Blue Card Command. So Blue Card is the on-deck platform, um, and I think that's what's kind of tarnished us establishing a quote-unquote writ sector because we believe, I shouldn't say we believe, we've kind of bled that language and that lingo into our command structure so we always assume on deck will be the guys going inside if something happens which it is what it is um i think that's part of our reason why in our area now uh some fires we do set up writ some fires we don't it's just one of those things i think i think blue cards really tarnish some of that and so i mean i'm not an authority by any means on really anything that has to do with incident command um I wear a black hat and I uh, pretty much drive the rig. Um, so what I can tell you uh, from what I know of blue card is the whole on deck thing. I, I don't think that really jives uh, with, with RIT as we know it today. I, I actually think that that's, that's detrimental uh, in the overall scheme of firefighter safety and survival for the guys that are inside. Because just like I talked about before, how like for three seconds after being assigned RIT, you're like, oh man, I wanted to go inside. And then you change your mindset and you're focused the entire time on what the building looks like. What are the challenges? What are the hazards? Where are crews operating? And I have a big problem with crews rotating in and out of writ at a fire mm -hmm. when you, when, when there's so many things that you're looking for and you're trying to stay in that mindset. I, I just, I just don't think it's realistic. I don't think it's, I don't think it's effective. You're not going to have that, that A to Z kind of mentality of writ and not only just writ as responding but also writ as prevention kind of like lieutenant k talked about with kind of a safety engine concept what can we do just to improve overall safety if we can prevent again whether it's a mayday from somebody falling through a floor into a basement or if it's an engine driver having a heart attack one of the things i talk about in my longer programs is uh how i don't remember the percentage off the top of my head but so, a, a decent percentage of maydays according to Project Mayday, are medical in nature. A couple of years ago, we had an engine driver, first due to a house fire. He's outside, charges the line, the second due engine's pulling up, he's laying on the ground right next to the engine. He had a massive heart attack, and he's in cardiac arrest. Luckily, thank God, they, they worked him, and they got him back, and he was able to retire and, and spend time with his family now. But 
you, I, I just don't think you're going to have the same effectiveness by rotating crews in and out. Um, we had a big two alarm commercial building fire today at a, uh, at a glass factory here in Toledo. It got into the roof. It was real stubborn for the guys. And they had the same, the same engine was assigned writ for, I don't know, I, I think it was the first two and a half hours of the incident. And guys are up on the roof working. We have crews inside and they're staged in, in a close location. And they were, they were committed to writ. Because again, I, I feel like if you rotate people in and out of that, it just, it just doesn't work. Yeah. So I agree. I think that's part of it. Um, secondly, like in, in suburban departments, I, I still work part-time at one. Uh, and I've, I've worked at a couple others. I think it's a couple, a couple things. One, if, if you can get a knock on the fire quick, you don't need writ, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have plenty of fires that are room and contents and the first engine gets there and they have fire showing out of a window. They go up, they get a quick knock on the fire. And by the time writ, either gets on scene or gets the equipment and gets up to the front of the house, the chief will just say, it's, yeah, go in service, right? It's, it's not a big yeah. deal. Problems solved. So if that's the case, great. Um, obviously, we put the fire out, all of our problems start to go away. But um, sometimes I think everybody would probably agree that sometimes uh, there's a little bit of, well, that we don't get that many fires. Like, I want to go inside and get some work. Like, Nobody is, nobody's going to say that out loud, but I think we've all been there. Uh, anybody that's ever worked at a smaller department, like we only get one or two of these a year. Like I want to make the most of it. Mm -hmm. um, or also some of it's just complacency or not really wanting to believe that, uh, that it could happen to us. Yeah. I think terminology also is, is, is real key in, in some areas. I just got a text from one of my buddies. Every time I kept saying sector, he died a little bit. So, you know, everyone has different terminology and, and, and when they set up writ or they set up uh, uh, an on deck, you know, maybe on deck is someone's writ. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I just know Lima's, the Lima, I shouldn't say Lima, the Allen County Lima area's terminology and how we kind of set things up on there. But so we have had in our area kind of slide into the commercial side, uh, several fires. I know Lima Fire Department had two massive type three warehouse style fires. Putnam County's had two type three fires. So in them situations and those large buildings, and you kind of hit it a little bit that you don't split your RIT teams up. How many RIT teams on your large commercials do you guys uh, put into place when you get more? I, I'm assuming if it's a, a two alarm or higher fire, you establish more RIT on, on the scene. Yes. Yeah, so again, um, you're always going to have that for us, that fourth due engine is always going to be assigned RIT, um, whether it's a, um, a one and a half story, 1500 square foot house or a three story garden apartment or a two story warehouse. They're always going to be assigned that. The only, uh, the only exception to that is the way we run our high rise, uh, operations, which is an entirely different discussion, yeah. but, um, really it's going to depend on how much work there is to be done, to, to be honest with you. So, um, if, if we're calling for a second alarm, I mean, typically for whatever reason, our culture kind of uh, frowns upon calling extra alarms early. Uh, a lot of times in, a, in Toledo, you'll hear a, a chief or an officer call for, give me another engine or give me two more engines or give me three more engines. And then eventually dispatch is like, do you just want the second alarm? And they're like, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> and then five minutes go by and they want the second alarm. It doesn't always happen that way, but it, it yeah. happens enough. Um, so a lot of times there's, there's so much going on that um, the chief a lot of times will just start doling out assignments to crews. And a lot of times you'll hear the safety officer kind of get on the radio and suggest to the chief, hey chief, uh, can we get one of these companies to, as a second RIT team to put in the rear or to put mm -hmm. around the side or, or the RIT officer themselves, if, if safety is busy, the, the initial RIT officer might, might get on the radio and say the same thing like, hey chief, uh, we're, we're really gonna have a trouble covering this whole building, can we get a second crew? Um, and again, keep in mind, that's just for, that's just for standby or staging, right? right. Um, the, the reality is in the event of an actual writ and, and mayday deployment, you're going to need every bit of, uh, every bit of probably 12 to 15 guys. And in, in another way that, um, Toledo, we kind of wanted to say, ah, it's not going to happen to us. You look at Phoenix, you look at Asheville, these studies that came out after these fatalities, they said it's going to take 12 to 15 people to rescue one firefighter. Um, in, at Magnolia Street, I told you how small that building was. 
when we looked at that afterwards, we found that we committed 11 firefighters to finding those guys in such a small area. So that was one of the first things that we saw that we began to realize that maybe we were a little bit more similar to those instances than we thought. And you start talking about a commercial. Yeah. There's, there's a lot more, um, a a lot more considerations there just by the sheer size of the place, not even counting the other hazards uh, or tricks you're going to find inside. Mm -hmm. You said you had some pictures of, of commercial, some commercial stuff. Yeah. Uh, Hey, Lieutenant K, do you have something to say there for a second? No, you, you're, you're correct, though. Um, that's exactly what we do on uh, multiple alarm fires or large commercials. Um, the safety officer kind of takes that branch from the incident commander, and we have the authority to analyze the situation and add uh, an additional RIT team if we see fit. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we will develop that full safety sector. So the safety officer working with the RIT team is our full safety sector. So I have a crew to work with as a standalone safety officer, which is the RIT team, who's basically kind of like a safety a safety crew. And that's how we, how we kind of coordinate our efforts. Um, so we'll work together based on the, the situation and what we have. Right on. Awesome. Um, yeah, Jordan, I'll pull these up. Just a couple pictures to discuss a couple things. Um, We'll see. I kind of threw these together last second, so hopefully they... Uh, oh, no, it's, it's good, man. Um, so just some of the things are obviously, and everybody hears this because we talk about it all the time, but you got to get out in your area and uh, and you got to see what it is that you have. Um, so all these pictures are from uh, my either our first or our second due areas. We get out all the time and and just walk through buildings. We might have a run at one place and we walk across the street and go talk to a business owner or... Uh, if we're waiting on an ambulance, because here in Toledo, we don't automatically necessarily get ambulances sent on every EMS run. Sometimes we have to go figure out if they even need one or not. And then if we do, we call for it. And sometimes you're waiting 30 minutes. So a lot of times if you're on an engine, guys are pulling hose up to the front porch of the vacant across the street. Or if it's wide open, we'll just go walk through it because chances are we're probably going to get a fire there at some point. So this is this is one that uh, we walk through. We, we walk through quite regularly and, and it's it's just a good one for really knowing your district and knowing what it is that you have and what some of the challenges are. So um, you look at the, the alpha side here uh, on Adams. Um, there's one store in the, uh, in the first floor, just your typical taxpayer, your stairs there uh, on the Delta wall go up and uh, service multiple apartments on the second floor. You go around to the rear and this is what you see. The same building on Jackson and uh, whole bunch of windows get that door there on the right you probably can assume that it goes up to a uh, to a staircase to to get some access to the second floor and if you look at those three um, those three little sections to the left you get the two the two red ones there and then that orange one each of those are their own apartment so the two red ones are one apartment and then that orange one's its own little studio apartment that were added and renovated at some later time Um, so now you have your typical taxpayer considerations, but you're looking at this and you're like, this is, this is a pretty sizable building. So you go to the next, one of the things that we like to do a lot of times for commercial buildings, whether it's in pre-plans or even, even on the way to a fire, um, if we're not first or second due, because again, as writ, you're typically going to be, at least for us, you're going to be fourth due. So you might have an extra minute or two. Somebody will try to pull this up on their phone, whether it's on Pulse Point or Google Maps or whatever and just get a quick aerial view of this place. So if you look there on the left, that is what this thing looks like. And you see there's what looks like some gaps there in the middle. So on the right side, that is one of two courtyards inside that building. So if you go back and you look at this red door here on the right, you open that door and there's some stairs that can take you up into uh, and access the, uh, the second and third floor but you can also walk straight through another door and end up in this little courtyard area. This is where all the meters are for uh, all the apartments and the stores. And there's good chance that you might have, whether it's civilian victims or firefighters in a bad spot back here. So just little things like that, mm-hmm. that we're never thinking of at, at, a, uh, at a normal structure fire, that when you start talking about your, your, especially your type threes, your older ordinary construction, 
you're going to have some, you're going to have a lot of issues like that. We find a lot of little intricacies like this, whether it's an air and light shaft courtyard, whatever it is you want to call it. Um, I mean, we pretty much have to take a ladder through the building to get access to this more or less. So again, just getting out into your, into your district and figuring out what it is that you have. Um, this is a fire we had uh, about a year ago and uh, comes in about five o'clock in the morning in a, uh, uh, furniture like refinishing shop like a wood shop and um, real nasty smoke hanging down across the street uh, this is a one-story ordinary construction middle of the row uh, there's another store to the left uh, and then there is this carry out here on the right and um, we end up forcing the door and we start to make our way in um, the front area there was a um, uh, kind of like reception area and as we progressed further and further, we, we didn't know what kind of business this was. This wasn't my normal, uh, this wasn't my normal rig. I was actually working at engine 21 in the South end, uh, on overtime for this one. And, um, pretty soon we're, we're trying to crawl over a bunch of stuff and we're moving around a bunch of stuff and we can't figure out what it is. We're, we're pushing further towards the back. We've got zero visibility. There's a second crew in there. They just brought a two and a half in and we're not making any progress. The heat's getting a little higher. Guys are putting water into the smoke, trying to sound, trying to just figure out what it is that we're dealing with and where the fire is. They got a crew going around to the back, trying to coordinate with us on opening, forcing the rear door or not. And we start to see a glow ahead of us. Guys are hitting it with both of the lines and stuff just starts falling on top of us. And um, at pretty soon we just, we made the call and said, hey, we're backing out. We gotta, we gotta kind of regroup and figure out what's going on here. I don't know if there's a basement below us. I don't know where this fire is. It's, it's not very obvious to us. Um, so long story short, they end up, we pull out the front, they, they force some doors in the rear. They get a pretty good knock on the bulk of the fire. Well, we go back in there afterwards and, and obviously mop up, but just thinking some of the, the concerns that we had being what we later found out was, was this wood refinishing shop, furniture shop, all the lacquers and varnishes, that smoke was some of the nastiest smoke I think I've ever smelled and smelled for like about two weeks coming out of my skin. But inside all that stuff falling on us, we were crawling up and over and around table saws and drill presses. And there was chairs like wooden, like kitchen, like you'd have in your kitchen. They were stacked probably 10 feet high, eight and 10 feet high as we got towards the back of this place. And that's what was starting to fall on us as we were trying to, uh, to throw some water out ahead of us. And there, I mean, very easily could have just had a guy, not necessarily pinned, but very easily just trapped or cut off just by the sheer nature of being buried in an avalanche of wooden chairs. Mm -hmm. So could we have taken a couple seconds and tried to identify what this store was beforehand? Sure. Like I said, I don't normally work in this district. If I did, maybe I would know a little bit more about it, but this was this was one that for us was like kind of uh, kind of eye opening, just because we very easily probably could have just kept pushing. The truck was going up to the roof; they were going to vent, and um, and we just kind of had to make the decision that we're not making any progress. There's a lot of there's zero visibility even at the floor. There's zero visibility. This thick nasty smoke. We're starting to feel more heat. We're flowing water, and nothing's getting better. We just had to make the call and pull out again. It's it's not a house fire where you're 15 feet from a window. There's no windows in this place. It's literally the front and the back. There's there's a Bravo and Delta exposure um, being middle of the row. So obviously you have to take some of those things into consideration as well when it comes into um, progressing forward. And we one of the things that we did check and, and that you should obviously always check as far as um, commercials is try popping ceiling tiles, right? Well, lucky for us, this place had a, had a tin ceiling, so that wasn't so easy. Um, we tried and then also we weren't going to see anything anyway because that thick was so uh, dark. So all these little things added up to clues as uh, the attack, well, really there's two attack lines, not attack and backup, uh, clues that maybe something wasn't going right here. So looking at this fire from a rip perspective, though, looking at the smoke, looking at knowing the building construction, maybe trying to see if, there's, if there is a basement. One of the things that sometimes we don't consider is we're going to have to force entry into a into this neighboring store anyway to check for extension. If it looks pretty similar, can I get an idea of a layout? If the, mm -hmm. if the uh, store next door has a basement, chances are this one's going to have a basement. All kinds of little things like that as far as figuring out the layout um, and any intricacies 
as writ are going to go a long way. I can look at this place. Most of you guys can probably look at this place and figure out that it's, it's what, just that one store. You kind of see the door open there. It's what, maybe 20 feet uh, wide. And I think any of us could probably guess it's probably 60 to 80 feet deep. And that's about what it was. So thinking about uh, hose line selection for a commercial, even as writ, as writ, if these guys are pulling two and a halfs and have an issue, do I need a two and a half or do I need to worry on being fast and flexible? That line you see there on the sidewalk, that's an inch and three quarter that writ had pulled. So all these different things are things that you can think about as writ. Um, another thought that we don't really always hit as far as writ um, on the fire ground is what about guys on the roof, right? So if you, if you have guys on the roof, in this case, that smoke was so thick, writ, I believe, ended up throwing a second ladder uh, just for egress. So if the smoke shifted uh, or if there's a collapse, right, uh, the, the truck company on the roof has multiple egress points. Um, this was a good one. Uh, this was earlier this year. Um, really weird, weird place. They've had a couple fires in this place. Warehouse, industrial place had been vacant for years. Um, it's like four or five stories in one spot. And then on another spot, it's like, uh, it's like two stories underground and, and really huge. Um, I think they had crews inside when they, when they thought it was, it was pretty limited. Uh, these pictures are both from pretty far into the incident. Um, but even at defensive fires, maybe you, maybe you have the resources to have a RIT team established. Maybe you don't. I would hope you do. Um, but, I mean, think about all the issues that you can have just at a defensive fire, whether it's collapse or explosion. I mean, inside of this place, there's all kinds of weird chemicals and everything else that, that crews reported hearing, uh, hearing things explode. Um, just so many different variables that you're going to have at a fire like this versus a house fire. Um, are we going to have overhead doors? Are we going to have any supplemental security features like bars or screens or chain link or mesh? Or in a lot of ways, RIT can help kind of as that exterior truck operations. Uh, so in Toledo, we only, we only send one truck to a fire uh, unless there's a second alarm or a second truck is specifically requested. So a lot of times RIT ends up doing those exterior truck functions, whether it's throwing ladders, forcing doors, cutting overhead doors, prying off wire mesh. Um, so just again, things to think about as RIT, not as four people standing outside as, as basically a well-dressed bystander, but how you play an integral part in the progression of an incident, uh, whether it's firefighter safety by, uh, by actually performing rescues or preventing somebody from getting hurt, whether it's rolling an ankle or getting electrocuted, or it's just helping get crews in service and get lines in service at a, at a defensive fire. Uh, we'll skip that one. Just a little hey, higher. Jake, yes, sir. I did get a question. Um, how often do you guys do par checks in Toledo? What's your time intervals? So we'll do a par check uh, at like your average house fire. We'll do a par check when you come out of the structure. So we have 30 minute FCBA bottles. So if you figure by the time you get there, you're, if you're say the attack line, you're the first two engine company, by the time you get there, put water on the fire, your average, say the whole second floor of this house is going, you go up, you put out all the fire, you're starting to pull ceiling and chase uh, extension in the balloon frame and the knee walls and stuff. When you come out, you'll get, uh, you'll get that par check. So at a larger incident, uh, dispatch will give command time checks every, what is it, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever that is. And then command can kind of ask for those par checks at that time. But there's no, um, especially at your average house fire, we're not necessarily getting a, getting a par check every five minutes or anything like that. It's typically just when, when crews are leaving or maybe if they're changing assignments, um, something like that. Okay. I'll skip this one. Um, so this isn't a commercial, but I mean, what, uh, what, town in the United States doesn't have some guard departments like this. Mm -hmm. And what starts out as a little fire on the deck there uh, ends up burning around the corner to this building, which is where it finally got stopped. Uh, as you can see, a pretty windy day. And again, on these larger scale incidents, are we going to be able to split RIT? Probably not. We're going to have to put RIT in one position. Where does RIT, where does RIT really do the best at this spot, right? because we're probably, chances are in a situation like this, we're gonna have crews operating in multiple different areas. We might have crews trying to get ahead of this thing, pull some ceiling, maybe do a trench cut, whatever the case is. Obviously in a garden apartment like this, you're gonna have that common stairway. And a lot of times that 
a lot of times, not, not always, but a lot of times that common stairwell is combustible, right? Sometimes they're wooden stairs, sometimes they're concrete or steel, but a lot of times, at least around here, you're going to see, you're going to see wooden stairs. So as writ, do we maybe want to have a hose line and more or less protect those stairs to keep those from getting overrun to ensure that we have an egress? Maybe backup is more or less a second attack line. Obviously protecting egress is typically a function of the backup line, but if backup ends up being a second attack line, trying to get a hold on this thing as it, as it runs the cock loft, yeah, writ might have to kind of become committed. And if that's the case, you need to communicate that. If you're the writ officer and you pretty much have to commit someone to protect the egress for those crews, maybe you need to get on the radio, either the writ officer or the safety officer or whoever it is that you're going to have and really kind of advocate for additional crews um, because you're tied up here. It's not like you can just leave this and, and go respond to something else because if you leave this stairwell unprotected to go go deal with something else, now you might be causing, not causing, but allowing additional maydays to occur. So here I, I threw this in just because, like I said, every town in the United States has some form of garden apartments to, to one extent or another. And just some of the things that we don't think about uh, and too often we're trying to treat them just like a big house fire and they're not. Um, oh, there's nothing on that slide. Uh, how about like corner stores like this, right? Like every town in America I've ever been to has some variation of corner stores, whether they're wood frame or they're type three, um, sometimes a combination of both. Sometimes they're gonna be vacant. Sometimes they're not gonna be vacant. Um, at least in our experience, a lot of times they're on basements. Again, whether they're wood frame or uh, type three, you're going to have them on a basement. Um, a lot of times these have some interesting supplemental lock features. So the picture there on the right, I wish it was a little bit better. I was trying to get it as we were driving away, going to go, leaving one fire at night. But there's chain link fencing over the windows. And then if you look kind of underneath the sign there above the door, um, there's a framework with chain link and then there's two gates that swing open as well. So now even, even if the first two crews, they get through the, they get through the gates and they end up making it to the front door, they force the front door and they can start going in and putting some fire out for egress perspectives as, um, as writ, I, I need to get that. I need to get that opened up. I need to get that, uh, chain link off the windows if I can. Maybe I, maybe I want to think about, maybe, probably not initially, but maybe down the road, I want to think about pulling those aluminum awnings off the top too, right? I want to make sure that we have plenty of room to get guys out if we need to. Um, keep in mind, like a good, um, a good case study to look at uh, when it comes to a corner store like this, again, whether type three or not, uh, Buffalo in 2009, they lost uh, Chip McCarthy and Jonathan Kroom, uh, Buffalo, New York in a, in a convenience store fired very, very similar to this. I mean, think about all the weight, this old construction and all the weight of coolers and pot machines and refrigerators and all the shelving and just how much of an entanglement hazard and, and com how complicated that's going to be in zero visibility and high heat. Uh, typically, you're going to have some type of uh, living space above, right? In the typical taxpayer fashion, sometimes those are uh, inside uh, interior staircases. Sometimes they're not. There's Leroy Jenkins uh, hanging out. Um, just kind of know what's familiar in your uh, area. I know these two structures, uh, for example, both have um, a door that leads up to the second floor, but also into the basement on the street side. So both of these are on a corner. Uh, the top, you can see the, the delta side is on the corner of the, the intersection. On the bottom, uh, the Bravo side is on the corner of the intersection, and both of those have side access that lead directly to the basement. So if attack just blindly kind of runs in there, as Rit, like I mentioned in a house fire, typically if we have a, that side door to a house, Rit's going to force that door to try to evaluate conditions in the basement, but also so we have expedient access to the basement. Uh, as Rit, you might want to consider doing the same thing here. Also, on a lot of these type threes, one of the favorite, my favorite things to do when I travel, um, and it doesn't matter if I'm in a small town in Nebraska or if I'm in Ohio or if I'm in Indianapolis for FDIC, I love walking through alleys of, uh, of towns and just seeing what, the, what kind of supplemental locks and fortifications you'll find on the back of uh, structures. You go through any main street, small town in USA, 
no matter what you think, you probably have window bars, you probably have some drop bars, you have some other supplemental locks, maybe you have chain link fence, whatever, whatever the case is. So really every, every time I've ever been to is some form of, of corner store or some form of little main street that's going to have these issues. Um, <laughs> this is a, a bar, a old corner store that became a bar, then became vacant in Toledo. Uh, I don't even know if the building's still there or not, but they had a small fire there once. Uh, the truck went to the roof to cut. The chief told them, hey, we're going we're gonna to make this place code red, which in our uh, vernacular means that it's going to be a, a defensive attack only um, unless there is uh, a known life hazard inside. Um, so the interior crews are getting a knock. The truck goes to the roof. The chief told them to make a big hole. So they cut a massive five because it was truck five in the roof of this thing that, uh, as you can see here, was big enough to see from space. Um, <laughs> That's I'm not awesome. sure. I'm not sure if this place is still there, if it's been torn down yet. But uh, like I said, everybody's got them. Um, how about this one? So again, just another example of kind of that corner store uh, that is very common in in Toledo. Um, been renovated, right? So there's probably one or two units on the first floor. Everything's covered up. You see block wall on the uh, on the Delta side there. It's big picture windows. Uh, the mailbox is indicating the upper. Um, on those stairs and typically uh, even looking at the duplex to the right that wood frame duplex to the right I can look at that and know that the door closest to the Bravo side is always going to be my access to the second floor right that stairwell is going to go right up the uh, exterior wall the door on the right that's going to be the first floor apartment so uh, going back to the to the uh, type three here though <clears throat> things aren't always as they appear you got that block wall and most times people aren't thinking cinder block or, or block like that when they think of type three, right? You're a lot of times thinking of, of brick, right? Your traditional main street type stuff. Well, as you get closer, things aren't always as they appear. I don't know when this was done. I had more pictures. I just didn't put them in here. But at some point they did like this skim coat and stamped it to look like bricks and painted it. But it's actually a wood frame structure underneath this. So why one wall is blocked, I don't know. I don't know when this happened or when it was changed, but uh, they actually did this over top of the wood siding all the, the rest of the way around this, this building. Super weird, um, but just keep in mind, things aren't always going to be as they appear. Uh, also keep in mind that on a lot of these uh, taxpayers, you're gonna have <clears throat> two, uh, two access or egress from the second floor. So in this case, they had a door here in the front, then they had an exterior stair in the rear. Sometimes it's gonna be exterior, sometimes it might just be a fire escape, sometimes it might be an interior stairwell. Just kind of know what's familiar with, um, with your first two area. Again, because while it's very helpful when you're attack, it's also gonna be a huge asset when you're writ and there's a mayday on the second floor, there's a mayday in the basement, and you already kind of have an idea of what some alternate uh, ways in might be, especially you get somebody that's lost. Uh, if, I, if I have somebody that's lost inside of a house fire or even, even a, a store kind of like this one, right? I mean, it's a good size, but it's not enormous. I probably want to attack this from a different angle than the, the way that everybody else went in, right? Because if one guy out of the 20 people or 15 people or however many people, if one guy is lost that all went in the same way and he hasn't found anybody else, maybe he's not in that spot anymore. So maybe if I do go in that other way that I know leads me to wherever they were operating, maybe I'm going to find it. Um, <clears throat> this was, uh, this picture was from a chop shop uh, in our area. Um, like legitimately like actual chop shop, like the, they actually, I think are tearing it down right now, but it's, uh, it's been a good spot. We would go in there every couple of weeks and there'd be different cars in there. Uh, a lot of chargers, a lot of Cadillacs. Um, <laughs> but we'd get some small fires in there from time to time. And there's all kinds of hazards, whether it's um, open, uh, open areas like there on the left, where if you were doing a search, for example, you could uh, very easily fall and um, get disoriented. But then, uh, obviously, just the hazards of, um, of car fires inside of a larger building. Uh, this is kind of around the corner at that same spot, just a bunch of debris. And then you see there, kind of in the center, <clears throat> there's an open... Uh, there's an open door, and then to the left of that is an open elevator shaft. I mean, we see a lot of those in a lot of vacant uh, industrial occupancies that you really have to be cognizant of. Um, I mean, just think in the last 10 years, they're the two that immediately come to mind 
uh, firefighters getting killed, falling into unprotected elevator shafts. You had uh, Daryl Gordon, Don Columbus, and you had um, you had the guy in Chicago. I, his, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but two in the last 10 years alone that I can think of off the top of my head where guys have, have died falling into uh, unprotected elevator shafts. It's, it's definitely out there. And again, it's not just a big city problem. <clears throat> uh, just another... Another vacant um, in our first two area there on the left. This is a pretty big one. I don't remember what this place, I think this was a mattress factory or something like that back in the day. But very challenging access just because everything in the front is boarded up and, uh, and or blocked over, like even windows and doors uh, were actually blocked over in a lot of cases on the front. So you may have to pre-plan this to where you know I have to pull the engine down the alley just to get access into this building. Um, a lot of things we find in some of these places, unprotected stairwells like this, right? Somebody's taken the railings so they can scrap them. Um, unprotected elevator shafts, again, this place is, I think, seven or eight stories. We're up on, I think, seven maybe. Um, but you can see how easy it would be to crawl off this. I mean, I'm hanging on to a, a railing kind of around the corner and sticking my phone out uh, over the ledge because I didn't want to fall in myself and the place wasn't even on fire. Um, and then you'll see here, Looking at the side of that elevator shaft, I mean, walls are busted out anyway. So even if you were aware of the elevator shaft um, from the from the normal hoistway doors, you could be searching a different room or, or trying to uh, to find the seat of the fire and end up falling into it anyway. So a lot of hazards there as interior crews. But how do, how do we plan for these things as writ? Like I said, you're not going to be able to plan for everything, every possible or potential eventuality. But remember, it was. The stats I had from Project Mayday were something like 90% of the time, it's going to be a relatively simple and non-technical problem. So what we've done is we break that down into simple and uh, complex maydays. It has nothing to do with how dangerous it is, uh, any, any level of lethality or anything else. It just has to do with how complicated is it going to be to get this person out of whatever predicament that they're in. And focusing on the big five tools is going to fix almost all of those simple Mayday events pretty rapidly. Uh, the complex ones, yeah, you got some guy that falls into an elevator shaft, somebody that's pinned by a collapse, anything like that, yes, it's gonna take uh, advanced skills, some technical knowledge, and some extra tools that you wouldn't commonly use. So definitely prepare more for that in your commercial setting, um, especially with a lot of these older buildings that may or may not be in uh, various states of disrepair. Again, uh, just another building with uh, somebody took the railings out. So just something as simple as, as going up and down stairs uh, can be a little bit more hazardous than you would think. So um, that's really kind of all I threw together for pictures, just some things to talk about. Um, but um, really, I mean, we're lucky that, I shouldn't say lucky, but the vast majority of the fires we go to are, um, uh, are house fires, just probably like anybody, right? Um, we do have a fair number of um, larger uh, type threes and, and some warehouses and such that we'll get every year. But one of the big things to remember is depending on the structure type and the fire conditions and everything else is we can't, we already talked about not splitting RIT for a larger, uh, a larger structure, but you also can't treat this just like a regular house fire in that house fire, we're typically going to pull an inch and three quarter line and going through the front door commercial occupancies hopefully you're pulling a two and a half and we're going in wherever the probably the best access is but as writ um just because you stand at the corners or in the front yard as a crew at a house fire you don't have to do the same thing at a commercial fire or an industrial fire uh the one fire i was mentioning today that we had in, in the city uh, i was two alarms and i think they specialed for another rescue and another engine on top of the second alarm um, but they ended up having writ pre-staged, not on the first floor, not on the, not at the sidewalk or at the command post, but they actually had writ pre-staged on the second floor. Crews are operating on the third floor in the attic, or excuse me, third floor in the roof. So they staged on the second floor, uh, away from any smoke or, uh, or fire, but close enough that they could at least get something done, uh, pretty quickly.
here. Um, guys, the everyone that's watching the link that's um, here in the chats, this is a Google Doc. This is just a course eval. Um, so with these, Jake, I send out training CEs uh, for everyone that participates. I go back through the Zoom um, records and everyone gets a couple hours of training CEs. The biggest thing when we did this through Schwartz, we started with the pandemic because obviously all the in-person training stopped and we wanted to try and keep it going. So this is one of our thank yous uh, for everyone that takes their time. So they get a couple training hours for it. Um, if there's any questions for Jake, um, he's got a wealth of knowledge, not only in this aspect of the fire service, and he just uh, posted his contact info in there as well. He's got a wealth of knowledge, not only in the writ, but uh, in the rescue side of things as well. Jake, are you still doing your training gig on the side? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, kind of like you said, with, uh, with COVID, uh, everything's kind of been on pause. And so this year I've actually, uh, I was actually assigned for most of the year to our special operations bureau. So I wasn't on the line. Uh, working every third day, uh, being a normal fireman. Uh, most of this year, I was assigned to our Special Operations Bureau, where we were solely doing hazmat, USAR, tech rescue, dive, swift water rescue, all kinds of stuff. That's how you and I ended up crossing paths earlier this yep. year. Uh, yep. Never thought that I'd see you on a run. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. First that time was... for everything. Um, right. So um, between COVID and then just uh, working Monday through Friday on this schedule was, uh, was a big change. So yeah, we're, uh, we're getting back into the swing of things, but uh, Squad 5 Fire Training, you can hit us up on Facebook. Uh, don't post on there as much as I should. I need to get a little bit better about that. But uh, It's hard, man. It's hard to keep up on social is. media. It is. It takes a lot of time. Um, if there's no other questions for Jake, I'm going to give you guys